Okay, fantastic. So um, thank you everyone for joining this webinar on the Mental Health Act, as well as the, uh, the white paper. Um, so this, this is a very important discussion. It's a very topical uh, area, and I will be chairing this discussion, discussion with our three experts. So my name is Maran Javid. I'm an old age psychiatrist in the Northwest, uh, and I'm really grateful to have such a, such a great mix of guests. So please do ask questions. We will try to address them, um, and we will try to, to get to them after the three presentations. So just, um, just be aware that uh, people with lived experience are also on this call. So it is a, obviously a privilege to have uh, that lived experience. So I'll, I would res respect everyone to, to all be mindful. So speakers do take responsibility of their slides and they'll be sharing their own personal views. That's a bit about MedTalks itself. It's a group of doctors uh, trying to plug a gap in accessing information about health and well-being free from the point of, uh, from the point of access. So clearly our aim is for it to be educational and insightful. So please do visit our YouTube channel. Uh, we do have forthcoming events uh, on medical leadership as well as faith and medicine. Um, so uh, some of the links will be available in due course. Um, so without further ado, uh, I'd like to start off with our uh, first expert. So we've got Dr. Adi Akinola, um, who's a general adult consultant psychiatrist working in Pennine Care. He's driven to eradicate stigma in mental health and he's very passionate about medical education, both on undergraduate as well as postgraduate level. He is Associate Director of Medical Education uh, within the Trust, uh, and he's also very keen to support welfare of mental health professionals, as well as uh, getting involved in supporting psychiatric trainees uh, following serious untoward incidents. So he's also completed a master's in law at the University of Manchester, and is also a senior clinical uh, lecturer there. So certainly uh, what reforms that to be considered and how they may impact is a central part of his role. So over to you, Dr. Akinola. Thank you, Mirren. Thank you for um, inviting me to this forum as well. Um, certainly lots of ex experts out here as well. So I wouldn't claim to be an expert, um, but I'll share my, my opinion and views about things. I think that's useful. Uh, I think it's also, you know, quite timely as well uh, with the white paper. So I'll just be giving a quick uh, snapshot um, of the uh, mental health reforms and do the white paper especially. Now, as you're kind of aware, uh, there are over 150 recommendations and it's impossible to do that within 10 minutes, but I'll be sharing, um, you know, key aspects or key areas from the white paper, uh, key areas that might likely have a huge um, effect on how uh, we practice um, psychiatry. In the you know in England and Wales, okay, and I'm sure we'll have questions later. But I thought it'd be good to have a quick look at you know the, the the history itself in terms of mental health act and you know why we're talking about it now. Uh, you know the mental health act itself you know, legislates for you know non consensual medical treatment of mentally disordered people uh, who present risk to themselves or to others. Of course, we can have people that have been to hospital. Um, as voluntary or informal patients, but of course, um, in terms of what we're talking about tonight, uh, people sometimes um, are compulsively detained in the, in the hospital um, for treatment. And looking back at the history itself, you know, back in the mid 18th century, with the Mad Madhouse Act, then uh, back then, uh, you sometimes look at it and think, "Wow, is there has there been any major changes at all?" Uh, back then, the only way they, uh, you know, supported people with mental health problems was to uh, detain them in private houses called madhouses, um, and there people were usually given inhumane treatment. Also, from the other point in time, they also noticed that people um, who were well uh, were also detained and kept there against their wishes as well. Um, it was until a few people spoke at that point in time. In fact, a particular woman um, had her son detained there uh, illegally until she got a magistrate to, to get him out. Um, that, and then, of course, they formulated the madhouse act in 1774, then later on amended uh, a few years later on. Moved on to the Lunacy Act back in 1845, 1890. And of course, what we're more familiar with, the Mental Health Act, um, you know, first uh, brought into place in 1959, 1983, which has been amended many times. The last amendment was in 2017. And of course, there are now proposals to, you know, create some reformation, which is good. Now, why the changes with the Mental Health Act? You wonder, why do you change things? I guess, um, you know, it, it's time to think about changing things with the times as well. Things have changed, the times have changed, and it's important that legislation we use to support people uh, who suffer mental health problems can be 
um, you know, it's appropriate and timely as well. Used over 50 times a year in England and Wales. And that number is rising year after year um, as well. So rising number of formal admissions, so people are more detained. And also, um, you know, there is a disproportionate number of detentions of people from ethnic minorities. And I've given an example here of community treatment orders, for example, where you have, you know, 60.1 uses of CTOs per 100,000 population and people from a black uh, ethnic uh, background compared to 6.8 uses per 100,000 and someone from a white ethnic background. That's almost nine times fold, really. And when people are detained in hospital um, under the mental tact, the, the incidence of restraints and seclusions also is quite disproportionate as well in terms of 15 to 56.2 uh, uses per 100,000 for someone from a black uh, and ethnic minority background compared to 16.2 uses per 100,000 population in someone from a white background. So there is a disproportionate number of detentions among ethnic minorities and there, there needs to be a, a look and a check at this to find out what else can be done. And of course, there needs to be modernization. There needs to be reformation for things to change, for things to get better. We've got to move with the times. Hence, there needs to, to make changes to mental health. Act. And like I said, there are over 150 recommendations, but I've actually just picked out very key areas uh, from this. Now, one of the first proposals is a change or an addition to some of the statutory principles. Uh, in addition to the you know, five, five principles in the code of practice, they're saying that we should be adding this you know, statutory principle that's really, really important. Talked about choice and autonomy, saying that we should be ensuring patients' views and choices are respected. Emphasis on least restriction, ensuring mental health powers are used in the least restrictive way um, as well. There needs to be consideration for a therapeutic benefit for the use of the mental health act. So ensuring that patients are supported to get better and discharged as quickly as possible. So there must be a benefit to detaining people in hospital. It's not for punishment, uh, not for that reason at all, but actually there must be a benefit to that individual. And of course, the emphasis has to be the individual. Not to anyone else, not to family, not to friends, not to, you know, it's to the individual. You have got to treat the individual as a person. So these key principles have been identified as ones that will actually help to create a great reformation with the mental health act. Other key things they proposed, uh, proposed in the white paper, is to tighten the criteria for detaining people under section two and section three. Section two, when you want to admit someone for a period of assessment, usually up to 28 days, and section three for up to six months, and that can be renewed. There's, a, there's an emphasis that there needs to be a substantial likelihood of significant harm, either to self or to others. So rather than just the usual risk to self, to others, or to health and safety, it's about substantial likelihood of significant harm or risk to self and others. And the reason why that's been put in there is to make sure that the you know, clinicians, the people involved in administering the mental health act think carefully about you know, the, the, the rationale for wanting to detain someone under the mental health act. Other proposals as well, talked about more in terms of mental health tribunals. Um, they want to, they're proposing more hearings as well. So, you know, for example, someone detained in the section two currently uh, has up to 14 days to appeal. After 14 days, they've lost that right to appeal, but now they're thinking of extending that to 21 days, which will give people more opportunity to be able to appeal. Which means, me, which means that people that have been in hospital for a couple of weeks and were really unwell at that point in time, I couldn't really appeal by week two and a half, week three, uh, you know, by, just before 21 days, if you start to feel better and they feel, oh, I want to get out of hospital, I want to appeal, then they are able to do that. Also, section three, uh, they can apply, uh, appeal up to three times in the first 12 months as against twice. So just giving people more opportunity to be able to appeal and challenge their detention and treatment in hospital. They also want to expand the powers of tribunals. Tribunals be able to grant leave and order leave, be able to order the transfer of patients in between other hospitals or from secure units. Um, they can also give directions to community services. You know, that's one of the key areas, one of the key issues. Apart, apart from changes to legislation, uh, one of the things identified is the fact that there isn't adequate community support, adequate support in regards to community services. And so tribunals can actually order uh, community services to provide certain forms of services to help people. There's also 
a discussion around the possibility of abolishing the rules of a manager's panel. Uh, you know, there's talks about what's the purpose of manager's hearings, what's the purpose of these panels, would they actually achieve anything? Does it actually um, help to continue to, you know, fight or secure the rights of patients detained under mental attack? So there's discussion around the role of, of managers. This is a very, very key one um, in terms of advanced choice documents. Of course, we have similar things in the Mental Capacity Act, like your advanced decisions, um, your advanced statements. You've, you've got the, you know, the LPs and so on, the Mental Capacity Act, lasting power of attorneys. Now, the, what, what they're proposing is giving people the opportunity to be able to make advanced choices about the treatment. So when an individual has the capacity to make a decision about things, then they can set out their preferences about their future treatment. And if they're admitted to hospital, possibly detained in hospital, then if they lose capacity to make decisions, then this advanced choice document will be considered. And clinicians will be required to consider the contents of this advanced choice document while it's in the mental tax. For me, I think it's a work on development as well, uh, because it gives people opportunity to also actually plan in advance as well. We know that mental health disorders can be, you know, relapsing and remitting, and people can relapse and become unwell. But it gives opportunity for people to actually plan things in advance. It gives people opportunity to sit down with their, uh, you know, with their um, support support workers to plan their future treatment. I also, propose changes to consent to treatment and statutory care and treatment plans. So in terms of consent to treatment, um, normally there are different categories in terms of that. So you've got the category, category one, two, three um, treatments under uh, you know, part four, the mental tax. And category one treatments are the, uh, you know, the very invasive treatments, for example, might be lobectomy and so on. You've got category two, which are invasive, like the ECT. And then you have category three, which has the other treatments. Now, for I think for category two, for instance, which is the ECT, if someone is refusing, has capacity and is refusing treatment, or is felt that they meet the you know, section 62 criteria, that's the there's an immediate risk um, to that person's health, and they feel that person meets the criteria, and the thing is that urgency there, then um, a clinician could ask that this should the treatment should be given, but this needs to be applied, this needs to be authorized by a high, high court judge. Um, for an individual also um, who might lack capacity, um, but has actually completed an advanced choice document to say they don't want a particular treatment, but they lack capacity at that point in time. But the clinician, the responsible clinician, feels that the, you know the mid section, you know, 62, that 62 criteria in terms of the immediacy and urgency of that treatment and the risk to their to their health and safety. Then again, the clinician. Um, might want to go ahead with this, but it needs to be authorized by um, a high court judge as well. So those are significant changes as well. I guess there are pros and cons to this, but something we can discuss later on. Uh, in terms of category three treat treatments, uh, that's other forms of treatment. So either medication, for example, administration of a depot and psychotic. Um, again, clinicians are encouraged to um, make sure that they, they assess individual's capacity to consent or not to consent to those particular treatments. And in certain individuals, for example, I can give an example. If someone is being considered for a depot and psychotic, for instance, they've got capacity, um, but they're refusing, um, the, they're refusing the treatment. Uh, that, if the clinician needs to, needs to judge to see, do they meet section 62 criteria? That's the section 62 A, uh, B and D criteria, i.e. the immediacy and need for treatment. If they feel that there is an urgent need for that treatment, um, but they're refusing, but they're refusing, then the the respiratory clinician can actually give that treatment, okay, at that point in time, if there's an urgency to it. Now, if the person lasts capacity, um, but at the same, but lasts capacity, but is refusing treatment as well, and they feel there's an immediacy as well to it, i.e., meet section 62 criteria, um, then uh, the clinician can also give that treatment as well. However, at those points in time, then something needs to happen in terms of the SWAD starts to kick in early because the, the second opinion appointed doctor usually will come in after three months um, to, to, to sign up a certificate of treatment. But that, that would change uh, um, now. Now, if people are refusing, even though they have capacity 
or they have an advanced choice decision about something, but they don't have capacity um, to, to, to consent to it at that point in time, then the SOAD has to come in early, and they're talking about 14 days or so, to come in early to be able to certify um, that treatment. So the responsible clinician can issue the treatment where a SOAD certificate needs to be issued. If a patient lacks capacity, but is compliant uh, and is not an urgent treatment, of course, it needs the SOAD approval as well, but they're bringing the certificate authorization forward. Rather, rather than three months, they're bringing it forward to two months. Again, to make sure that patients are seen very early and that uh, we're making sure that we're identifying plans. Now, there's also a change in plan as well to make sure that care and treatment plans are mandatory for everyone with a mental health problem detained. They're mandatory. They've got to be done within seven days and the responsible clinician has to be really involved in that. And they've got to be signed off by the medical director or clinical director within 14 days. That's a change as well. Okay, this is a very important change as well, nominated persons, um, which is very different. You're thinking nominated person to be placed in their facility. So in the narrative of this concept is possibly a cake, is what they're saying. Um, as some of us might be aware that, you know, if, if, if they're determined, trying to determine someone's nearest relative, they think about the, the father, the mother, who is the oldest in the family, and then there's a grade in terms of who it goes to. But they're saying that people can actually choose um, their nominated person. As long as they have capacity, then they can choose. If they do not have capacity, then uh, it can be done on their behalf by the approved mental health practitioner. A big change is that children under the age of 16 can also choose the nominated person if they're deemed to be really competent as well. Okay, those are important changes as well in terms of encouraging autonomy and patient choice. Okay. Um, they are, at the moment, the power to actually displace uh, a, 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 a nearest relative sits with the county court, but the proposal is that a nominated person, this part to display can actually be given out to the tribunal. They want to strengthen the role of the, of the independent mental health advocates in terms of advocacy, making sure that patients have access to advocates. Advocates can actually appeal on behalf of patients to the tribunal as well. And the advocates should also be able to support not just detained patients, but also informal patients as well. Uh, I think that's very important. They will support patients to be able to write up or draft their um, you know, their, their document in terms of their advanced um, care documents, they can actually support them to do that. Okay, community treatment orders, like I mentioned earlier, well, they're used to often, that's the, that's the view about it, that CTOs are used to often, and sometimes they're very redundant and not, not um, renewed and reviewed as required. And as mentioned earlier on, they are disproportionately used among black people. So the plan is to review them um, as early as possible. They want to make them time limited as well, such that to be a maximum of two years, except the individual relapses, you know, before the two years. But the plan is to make sure that it doesn't last more than two years, the CTOs. Okay. Um, also, I want to try and streamline the, you know, the, the, the clear the dividing line between the mental capacity and mental health. Act. There needs to be a working together. Um, you know, what we've always said was, oh, mental health act trumps the mental capacity act which means that capacity is never really considered. But there's a, a call to review that and make sure that capacity is recorded and that interplay between the mental capacity and the mental health act is in place, and that's important. Um, there are also suggestions that actually, if patients don't have capacity and they're not objecting to being treated uh, in hospital, then they can be actually treated uh, with the use of dolls. Of course, it's going to change to the liberty protection safeguards possibly around April, 2022, okay? And that patients can be allowed to consent in advance. So i.e., a patient can say, if I become unwell again, I don't want to be detained. Even if I lose, I lose capacity, I'm happy to be admitted informally, okay? Very quickly, uh, in terms of, uh, in accidents and emergencies, they want to empower clinicians as well to be able to detain people in hospital um, for urgent mental health care. So whereas, uh, you know, uh, you know at, at this point in time, someone has a, a mental health problem, they're refusing to stay in a &E, for example, they're allowed to leave and then they call the police and the police bring them back on the 136. But they want to empower health professionals in a &E to be able to support patients and keep them in a &E and to support their mental health care. And I think that's essential as well um, to know, okay? Um, they want to extend powers of, of, of uh, you know, section five as well so that they can hold the people um, in a &E until they're being assessed. And then just 
I'm almost finishing up now. Um, in terms of transfer system as well, they want to speed up that process. So there isn't any delay. That's the key thing. They don't want to be to be any delay at all in trying to make sure that people are able to access mental health care. And then finally, in terms of people suffering with intellectual disability, people with intellectual disability and people living with autism, um, they want to avoid inappropriate admissions. And this is very, very clear. This is very, very common. And they want to review this as well. Uh, need to make sure that LDs, they, they want to redefine how they uh, define intellectual disability and autism, that they shouldn't be considered as mental disorders. And before you detain someone in a section two, you need to be certain that there's a probable mental health cost to their behavior that warrants assessment in hospital. I know there's a very quick um, overview of, um, like I said, over 150 recommendations, but those felt that it would be good to just um, highlight the key areas um, from the white paper. Thank you, Maren. Thank you. Thank you so much, Adi. Um, obviously, a, a whirlwind tour of the, uh, the recommendations, um, and you've summarised it perfectly. So there's, there's lots of questions coming in and reflections, so please do um, keep probing away, and we'll try to put it forward to our, um, to our guests in due course. Um, Michael, if, if I ask you to share your slides, that'd, that'd be great. Um, and I, I now uh, have Dr. Michael. Uh, Boat Whistle, who's a friend and colleague uh, within the Trust, uh, but he is a consultant psychiatrist in the general adult community um, and inpatient rehab psychiatry. He's a postgraduate site tutor for junior doctors uh, within the local area. He's also a member of the North of England Approvals Panel, which is collectively responsible for the assessment and certification of approved clinicians under the Mental Health Act uh, and associate training courses. Uh, as well as medical education, he's interested in how to provide genuinely patient-centered care, whether personally or institutionally, and continues to be an active uh, member within social media to, to discuss things further. Uh, and I guess to continue to, to challenge our own thoughts and uh, further understand how we can make things better. So over to you, Michael. Oh, Michael, you're just on mute. Yeah, so when you're sharing the screen, if you choose the share audio option. Ah, sorry. Um, I'd lost the sight of the Zoom page by sharing. Um, so thanks, thanks, Maren. Yeah, so I'm taking a slightly different approach with my uh, presentation just to pick up on some potential criticisms from various perspectives of the white paper and also um, alternative um, uh, uh, ways of constructing um, uh, mental health legislation. Uh, so. Sorry, Michael, to interrupt. Uh, have you got the slides up or are you in the process of doing it? Oh, have I not, uh, are they not um, showing? No, no, no. Oh, dear. Sorry. Okay. Classic um, it's technology. Right. There we are. Is that sharing now? Yep. Perfect. Great. Okay. So, um, so there's a brief summary. So, yeah, so from the prof pro professional perspective, I think I, I often consider um, the idea of evolution versus revolution, um, which is best. Um, and I think revolution for rev revolution's sake tends not to produce um, a very useful overall progress, because often what you get, um, unless it's very well thought out, is a very similar regime to the last one um, with new faces. Um, and so in order to make a lasting change, often it has to be in an incremental fashion, um, although there are exceptions. And so oh, what's good about um, these sort of gentle changes to the Mental Health Act is that clinicians who are already familiar with the Mental Health Act um, it can uh, help guide um, patients through the law and how to um, uh, get their needs met effectively. And, and I think that's that's quite good. I mean, I, I've, I've sort of called the test, uh, the good clinician test. Um, how easy is it for a good clinician 
to get you as the patient what you want or need. And I think, of course, you've got to have safeguards in the system for poor or abusive clinicians. Um, but at its at working at its best with the best possible staff, have you got a system that works smoothly and efficiently um, uh, with a sympathetic professional? Uh, so I've been looking um, across uh, social media and other media for um, useful criticisms of um, the Mental Health Act reforms and suggestions for alternatives. So I've put the people who have suggested them in brackets um, as references, and I've put a list of the references to their websites at the end of my presentation. So, uh, so We Care About Mental Health is, is one reformist um, uh, um, mental health advocate online who who had suggested things like judge authorization for all forms of compulsory detention um, as as soon as possible. So, for example, if somebody was to be admitted uh, in a compulsory manner, um, an authorization request went off straight away and uh, uh, and had to be acted on uh, in order to keep them any longer. And uh, using the law to mandate quality standards in mental health care is another suggestion. So, um, you know, what what good is it having um, uh, a very um, liberal act if you have awful, non-therapeutic, poor quality mental health services and inpatient care? Um, and then similarly, um, there's abuse within the mental health uh, system. So how can uh, people who suffer abuse when they should be receiving care um, get access to justice? Um, and how can they be treated as any other person who would um, expect ac access to justice um, in, in society at large? Um, one difficulty which I foresee with greater judicial involvement and which already occurs when judges are involved is the um, the cumbersome and resource intensive nature of court involvement. So it can take an awful lot of clinician time to prepare reports and uh, present them to the relevant people. Um, and, and that can be an advantage. And it, I think it was Alex Rutkin who, who described it something akin to difficulty by design. Um, you can design in cumbersome systems when a professional wants to do the wrong thing uh, and make the right way the easy way. And that works with medical errors. Um, if people are taking shortcuts, they should be shortcuts to uh, to something going well rather than shortcuts, uh, you know, designed in shortcuts which lead to people doing the wrong thing. Um, so what are, what omissions are there um, in the in the new reforms? Uh, well, one one uh, other angle is that they they're predominantly window dressing, and in fact they don't address the key features uh, laid out um, in the introduction to the report as the things they were designed to address. So, for example, the rise in the number of detentions might well be because of other uh, societal factors like austerity um, and the hostile environment and so on. And actually, by not addressing those. We're simply uh, uh, ignoring it, and the, the mental health act is a handy red herring. Uh, so, and then also advocates. I think um, overall the uh, um, push for more advocates, um, pretty much advocates for all in the reforms, is very welcome. And you know, are they helpful? Yes, uh, they can meaningfully represent the patient and their wishes, needs, and interests. They can provide a more in-depth support with navigating the system. Um, uh, they can fill gaps in holistic provision that, that services don't fill, um, such as the cultural representation that's been suggested with uh, new advocacy. But what if they lack knowledge of the patient or they don't really represent the patient, uh, but rather just trigger um, appeal mechanisms um, uh, you know, less, less thoughtfully? Um, or uh, uh, what if the team uh, is actually meaningful at holding the patient's needs without them? Uh, because, you know, you, uh, you say if you have a good named nurse who's looking after you, uh, showing you around the ward, uh, telling you what the, your rights are under the Act, 
um, you may well not need an advocate. And I also reflected that perhaps uh, the need for advocacy reflects a concession that the system itself is failing. Uh, is the system so coercive and, and so poor at getting alongside and helping people that, uh, that we have to resort to advocates when shouldn't the system itself be designed with advocacy from the start? Uh, so then uh, the uh, United Nations Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. Um, this is uh, something that's often cited as being incompatible with um, UK or English mental health law. And uh, for example, the um, Mental Health Act and Mental Capacity Act uh, allow for involuntary treatment and detention of persons with disabilities on the basis of actual or perceived impairment. And you could argue that uh, in, in under the psychosocial definition of dis disability that, that uh, you know, mental health uh, treatment uh, that's different to that which you would give to anyone with physical health problems is, um, is actually discrimination. And should we really have a mental health act at all um, distinct from, from uh, physical provisions? And similarly, the protection of others criterion. Um, it's uh, if if your preventative detention is is to be allowed for mentally disordered uh, solely on the account of of their risk to others, then that should apply to everyone. And in fact, isn't that just um, the policing of thought crime uh, and uh, 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 unsatisfactory? Um, so the the CRPD. There's a little bit of debate about what is actually compels the government to do and what effect it has on our laws because the actual statute itself is different to the interpretation provided by the committee so the UN have a committee that uh, liaise with states to persuade them of the need to change their acts and um, that uh, takes a, a perhaps a more hardline view one might say than uh, the act itself uh, and it mentions um, following people's will and preferences and uh, you know it said elsewhere you know we need to make sure that we're authentically following people's will and preferences and not to, uh, imposing on them um, and ask the question about should we treat those who decline but lack capacity uh, I address that a bit later also I think good good news that learning disabilities and autism alone will no longer be grounds for detention under section three um, uh, but interestingly, uh, um, Alex Rutkeen said, um, LD and autism, uh, for whom entry into hospital, whether formal or informal, almost invariably reflects failure in another part of the system. Um, and he also remarks, which I think is quite important, that excluding them from one legal uh, um, provision may simply lead to a relabeling of the locks on the doors of the institutions. I think that's quite an important insight because if we simply change the labels from Mental Health Act to Mental Capacity Act um, uh, or DOLS or the new safeguarding provisions, then we haven't actually achieved anything worthwhile. Um, so uh, Dorothy Gould, I found this quote from Disability News Service, um, she said it's devastating that so far from drawing adequately on promising international developments elsewhere in the full human rights set out in the UN Convention, the white paper repeats many major flaws in the Wesley Review. It retains a dominant medical focus and it aims to reduce but not bring to an end the fundamental breach of human rights represented by involuntary detention in psychiatric hospitals and forced treatment. And it has an ad inadequate focus on the range of multiple discrimination that exists. Um, so I'm not sure how I'm doing for time. Uh, uh, so it um, so fusion legislation I mentioned. I'll just mention these fairly briefly. Um, that fuses autonomy-based capacity rules with the uh, defined and regulated grounds for compulsion uh, that you might find in mental health law. Um, the idea is that own, that. Uh, uh, involuntary treatment would only be permitted when a person has an impairment of decision-making capacity and if treatment would be in a person's best interest and uh, that impairment could be for any reason um, and it's not specific to psychiatry um, and involuntary treatment would cease when the capacity is being re-established. So capacity, what are some of the issues with a capacity-based law 
Um, well, MCA and dolls, in my view, continue to generate confusion and disagreement, even uh, some uh, 15 or so years after the Mental Capacity Act came into force. And uh, decision making capacity uh, seems to be uh, subject to constant challenge, despite the principles of the Act being there to protect capacity. So I, I think particularly flawed are the concepts of understanding and using and weighing information, which seem to be too open to interpretation by assessors. So um, an individual can be said to demonstrate capacity while actually uh, making different choices to those that they would make as their usual self or their self prior or post episode. And they can give perfectly reasonable sounding explanations and meet the um, four stages uh, of the procedural capacity test, but actually, uh, is it really accounting for their values and emotions in decision making? Is it too cognitive? Um, and as uh, Buchanan and Brock said in 1990, um, a competent decision maker also requires a set of values or conception of what is good that is at least minimally consistent, stable and affirmed as his or her own. I think that's quite important. And um, this print idea of principle of charity, that there's a broad coherence with the person's general outlook. So it's not just that um, somebody can twist the definition of understanding or using and weighing to deprive someone of their liberty or uh, face constantly justifying their decision to allow somebody's autonomy. Uh, so uh, the review itself, um, but not the uh, white paper, gave five confidence tests for a move towards capacity-based legislation. So um, it said, uh, uh, and that would include uh, admission and treatment never being lawful with a, when a person with capacity refuses. And those tests were um, uh, the views of service users, you know, what do patients say uh, about uh, capacity legislation and um, the impact of fusion legislation in Northern Ireland, which has been coming in, but isn't yet fully enforced. So we don't know yet how that's going to work out and um, whether the assessment of capacity is reliable enough to provide the sole basis for care and treatment uh, that associated processes are adapted to support the change. So is everything else in place and uh, whether capacity based legislation can take into account what is in the public interest so i suppose that's hinting at uh, risk to others um so yeah so basalia and democratic psychiatry have included this um tweet from asylum magazine about how he established his his reputation reforming the asylum in Gorizia in the 60s before moving to trieste um, and uh, and it brought him international fame and influence, but um, but he's very little talked about in the UK. Uh, there was this article from the Lancet where it said he set out to abolish the mental hospital, not reform it, and his achievements in this aim were very considerable, but remain controversial. It was all done in one day, uh, um, uh, in theory although a lot of the hospitals were simply converted in name only to something else like a therapeutic community or um, a long stay accommodation, uh, but remained in essence what they were. And so there were criticisms at, at the time. He visited in fact Dingleton in, um, uh, um, up in the Scottish borders and uh, to, to see uh, Maxwell Jones therapeutic community there and took those but then he decided that actually he didn't like them for one reason or another and gave them up although he kept you know uh, some of them in his trieste model um so one criticism was uh, his insistence following foucault's thesis that diagnosis and incarceration were politically rather than therapeutically motivated and his slogan uh, liberty is treatment seemed to jar with uk psychiatrists um, and UK psycho psychiatry also failed to achieve the same levels of trust and engagement with society and patients that's so evident in uh, Berzaglian uh, psychiatry. Um, and he always considered his aim as much to change society um, as psychiatry. And uh, that showed in the outward looking engagement of followers. So perhaps we need to reach out more and form um, wider alliances for reform. Uh, so conclusions, I've, I've left those to um, other um, patient sources. If they are put into action, they will at best improve what is already in place, but they aren't 
uh, the end point for the change needed. Um, so that's a service user association. And um, uh, we welcome proposed changes in the Mental Health at White Paper, such as nominated person and increased right to advocacy, but it falls short of a social justice approach. And as with the existing act, in the absence of funding and the continuing hostile environment of the DWP and wider systemic racism, the act is irrelevant to the actual conditions people have to endure, which is from recovery in the bin. So there we are. Uh, thanks. That's great. Thank, thank you, Michael. Um, certainly gave me food for thought, and it certainly is terribly uh, long. I didn't, I didn't uh, have a timer on screen, so <laughs> yeah, no, it's okay. That's um, I'm mindful of time, so we will crack on. Um, I'll, I am going to try and play a video, but as it's uh, as it's getting prepared, uh, I'm going to introduce our next guest. Um, so. Okay, so our next guest is uh, Raf Hamazir, um, who's an expert by experience, um, and he's also been involved in the ethnic minority group um, on the independent review uh, of the mental health acts alongside uh, Professor uh, Sir Simon Wesley, who is also part of the key guidance committee of the National uh, Institute of Health and Care Excellence, also known as NICE, to provide guidance for people with learning disabilities. So he's also a judge on the Third Sector Care Awards alongside uh, Dame uh, Esther Ranson for about four years now. Um, he's clearly um, uh, well read and has an MSc in mental health recovery, and he's also um, the expert by experience lead in Cigna Healthcare. Um, he's, taken, he's been involved in 150 CQC inspections nationally, uh, but certainly what, what I'd want to hear from, uh, from Raf is his uh, primary role uh, being to ensure uh, patients uh, and their and their families have a voice at every level of the organization. So he, he does have a video uh, that he wanted me to play. So I'm just going to start it now. I'd first heard about mental health when I was getting in trouble at school and getting kicked out of school. A, a lot of bad things that used to happen in the area where it just becomes normal. A lot of friends dying. You never really identify yourself as a gang at the beginning. It's just a group of friends having a laugh. Substance abuse, smoking a lot of weed led me to committing an offence on a friend I became paranoid of, which resulted in me ended up on a medium secure mental health ward. Recovery was very difficult. There's not a lot of support out there after you're discharged. You know, there's not a lot of people to turn to. You've got a conviction, you've got a diagnosis of a mental health problem. And there's a lot of stigma and discrimination which create barriers to you getting better, to you reintegrating back into society. When I was in hospital, I used to complain a lot about various things relating from restrictive practices to short staffing levels. I actually ended up being friends with an inspector from the Care Quality Commission. She suggested that I become an expert by experience and upon discharge, that's exactly what I'd done. Coming across Signet Healthcare was, was really interesting because I saw a lot of positive things happening within their services. They kind of approached me to become an expert by experience lead for them. And my role is to ensure that service users have a voice at every level of the organisation. And I work alongside them to ensure the feedback is actually actioned and something is done with it to improve the service. Being able to sit down with a service user and tell them I've been through what they've been through and I've been through mental health services from a place where I understand where they're coming from and it's almost an instant moment. You can see the service user's shoulders start to relax. I definitely feel like I have meaning in my life now. Seeing the same faces throughout my childhood in young offenders institutions, mental health hospitals, put a fire in my belly to just want to change the status quo. Having people believe in you and giving you an opportunity really makes you want to not only not let them down, but not let yourself down as well. I've learned so much through the organisation. There's a 
is so much room to develop. And I, and I feel Signet has really been the leaders in demonstrating that actually we can involve people, even you know if they, they might have a troubled past or they might have mental health issues. Raf is like a breath of fresh air. He's brought a whole new lens into how we work with our service users and our patients, how we can learn from them much more effectively than we have ever before. If you're considering to come and work at Signet Healthcare, you're definitely making the right decision. It's a no-brainer. I think that you're not coming into this sector because you want to become a billionaire or you're doing it for the money. I think if you want to come into this sector, it's because you care, you're passionate and you want to see people get better. You want to help people. And at Signet Healthcare, you're able to see people's recovery from admission all the way through to discharge and potentially to come back and work alongside you as an equal colleague and staff member. Well, thank you guys. Uh, can you hear me well? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, as you can tell from the end of the video, it's a bit of a recruitment advert to get some junior doctors for Cigna. Uh, you made me giggle a bit when you mentioned Esther, uh, Esther Ranson in the intro. But um, what I wanted to do uh, was perhaps just touch upon the recovery model, something that I kind of promote a lot in my role. Uh, the recovery model is something that I'm sure a lot of you would know, stems from people from the dis physical disability movement in the 1960s, following the pharmacological revolution. And it was further supported in the 1980s by lived experience research. Um, I'm sure we've all kind of heard of uh, Anthony 1993, when he says living a meaningful life beyond diagnosis without necessarily being symptom free. And I guess that it well defines recovery as a concept. Um, Follow, like it took quite a while for us to start really seeing um, you know, it put into practice uh, nationally in terms of uh, mental health services. In 2008, we started seeing things like recovery colleges. We started seeing the use of experts by experience, who are people with lived experience of using or caring for someone who has used health and or social care services. And, um, you know, the, C the CQC, for instance, started using experts by experience on their inspections. And then um, we started seeing alternative models come out. You know, I started seeing all these things like um, music therapy projects and, and stuff like that. And I guess you could say all of these things fall under the recovery model. I wouldn't say these are new innovations, you know, um, over a millennia ago in the golden age of Islam, when we saw the first types of uh, institutions, if you like, um, we saw uh, places like Baghdad, which supported people with lived experience of mental health at the time through things like music therapy and aromatherapy. Just a bit of a shout out to my people there. And there's different views on what recovery is, uh, but there are underpinning themes such as equality, co-production, and um, not necessarily living symptom free, being more asset focused as opposed to deficit focused. And um, from my time, it's been a little bit of a journey. I feel like I'm getting an old man, become an old man now. But, you know, I spent a lot of my younger days in institutions, mental health services, and now coming out and having that academic and professional experience and being able to work alongside a lot of my esteemed medical colleagues. Um, I would say that I would, policy drives change. And um, I think me coming on and speaking to you guys, it might touch a chord, but when you hear the CQCs coming around or something, it touches the cord a lot more and get, gets you moving. So I'm a big believer in uh, policy and I think policy drives change. So when I was asked to chair the other ethnic minority group on the independent review of the Mental Health Act, um, you know, I, I humbly accepted. And one of the things that we were really keen on doing was creating some small wins. I don't know about everyone else, to be honest with you, but um, that was certainly myself. I mean, if you go on to like the government website, on the white paper and stuff, one of the first things they talk about is getting rid of dormitories. You know, we weren't going to sort everything out. I mean, like we, we, we had to start somewhere and I think um, we've come a long way and uh, I've seen it in my time. I mean, just a few years ago, I was on a secure ward and um, I never thought today that we'd be seeing service users allowed like mobile phones and stuff. If you told me that back then, I'd have told you go and have some PRN. 
So like we, we, we've, we've come a long way. So specifically on areas such as uh, BAME, um, I feel some of the recommendations like culturally appropriate advocacy that we wanted to put through were key. Um, I do challenge myself a lot on the time when we're talking about it, just in terms of resources and how realistic it is to roll out culturally appropriate advocacy. What do I mean by culturally appropriate advocacy? I mean, a lot of the time we have advocates who are not necessarily, necessarily representative of the demographics of the service users that are using services um, where, where they are. And we found that to be a little bit of an issue and a gap and specifically from a lived experience perspective. I found that if someone has an understanding of your culture, your background, it may, can make a big difference in the way care is viewed. And I'll touch upon that in a moment. Um, just in terms of uh, some of the points that I was picking up uh, when you guys were talking, um, it's like you know, managers hearings, again, it's a small win um, when we're having discussions about managers hearings because we're like what did they what did they really do like I, i'd love to hear from anyone here who's had any experience of a manager's hearing actually doing anything because i certainly haven't had any experience of that nor does anyone that i work with i think it's a waste of time and resources and could be shifted towards enhancing more access to tribunals and um, i'm sure some of some of you may disagree with that um, on the point of uh, informal, I always question whether informal is really informal. When you're informal and you're on a ward with people who are detained, um, the door's locked. And uh, I think sometimes they've got a sign up saying you can leave when you want. Um, but that can often lead into a, a you know, is it a section 5-4? Is it called? I'm sure you guys will know. Um, so, one of the questions that I really wanted to put forward and to challenge both myself and the, the review and perhaps the government on is uh, really around resources. So on the points such as culturally appropriate advocacy, we haven't seen resources freed up. And I know Michael touched upon it in the chat. Um, I think we need to see resources to enforce some of the recommendations uh, that we put out there. And um, until then, we won't see much change and it's an ongoing process. Um, Michael touched upon some comments and, you know, I said you touched on whether the system is coercive or not, and I would say yes it is, and um, until the system is perfect, that is why there is a need for advocacy, um, and specifically culturally appropriate advocacy. And um, I mean, on the point of triggering appeal mechanisms, I mean, what's wrong with further scrutiny? Um, you know, when you have external or independent structures in place to review people who have their most basic human right taken away from them. Is it not another safeguard to make sure that, you know, we're doing things right? Um, I think clinicians ought to be in, you, you are to be fair, um, open to scrutiny and open to be challenged, um, especially for such important issues. For example, you know, we, we pulled up something, Michael, about the Convention on uh, Rights of People with Disabilities. I mean, about the, the convention of human rights. I mean, the use of seclusion and long-term segregation, forms of solitary confinement, a recognized form of torture in which research supports can actually cause trauma and psychosis within itself. I'm not saying that, you know, these things shouldn't necessarily be used. There are, of, of course, times when they should be. But I mean, scrutiny is something that I think is really important and um, we ought to open ourselves up to a lot more. Um, but I would argue that a lot of these changes that we expected from the Mental Health Act review are not necessarily for the Mental Health Act review or for the, for the white paper. I mean, for me, a lot of the change that needs to happen starts with our clinicians. It starts with uh, the medical team, how clinicians are taught in uh, academia, for example, um, uh, engaging with BAME communities and building trust. And I know we say that very, like people just say that. And I can imagine if you're not from a BAME background, you can get pissed off sometimes when we say these things, because what does that mean? I'll tell you what it means. I mean, we need to build trust with communities and raise awareness around mental health. So when, for example, like my mate who's Muslim, like myself, his voices, his dad takes him to a psychiatrist instead of an imam. And um, that involves going out and working with the community and building trust, going back to historical times when you look at clinicians and, and, and uh, 
people from a medical background. They were held as, you know, pillars of the community in high regard. You still are these days, but in terms of um, your knowledge in academia and, um, you know, your salaries and, you know, you think of these six figure salaries and stuff. Um, that's all great, but I think that there needs to be more community engagement to build that element of trust, specifically within communities. And finally, um, in my, both my experience of uh, using mental health services and now working within them at a strategic level, I would even challenge the concept of whether clinicians truly believe in recovery. And I know that is going to be quite uh, hard for you guys to hear. But I mean, you know, just... Um, Take, take my own examples, for instance. I mean, I remember my, my clinician, my RC, telling me, you know, Raf, you ought to go and study to study for GCSEs and then do this and then do that. And just kind of said, I want to go to, you know, university. You know, that's a dream of mine. And um, he kind of said, oh, well, why don't you go and do like this art workshop or something? Which again is great if that's your interest, but it wasn't really my interest. And um, my point that I'm getting to is, is that when I do come across clinicians that way in my care these days in my work, and you know, they've seen that I've lost 100 kilos and I'm off philanzapine and I've done a master's and you know, without having any of these GCSEs or these um, you know, art courses that they wanted me to go on, I often um, kind of ask them, you know, is it like, did you think it was possible? like when you saw me half naked in a seclusion room. And um, that, that I say it all really. Um, so I guess uh, my point is, is that it's, it's deeper than the Mental Health Act review and the white paper and um, society and academia, us as professionals, clinicians, all need to work together in how to move forward and um, Hopefully that opens up a little bit of a discussion. Thank you, thank you, Raf. Um, prepared presentation, so um, uh, let me off where I did. No, it's um, you know there, there's so much to actually try to to talk about, and obviously it's 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 your journey, and we have to respect that, and we have to reflect on what it has meant to you. Um, I am also mindful of time. Um, so I'm gonna try and spend no more than 15 minutes because we've had lots of questions come through, but I, I don't want to leave you hanging, Raph. There is one thing I wanted to um, ask you and then go to our uh, extended panel is that, I guess if, if you looked at the white paper now and put yourself in the situation you found yourself in back then when you were uh, brought into a medium secure unit, would your experience be any different? Um, certainly, I feel if I had the, the, on the points of advocacy, um, because what we have to understand is, especially if you're new to the system as such, um, an advocate can help you navigate through it. And I remember when we were talking in the chat, I made the point that it's almost like starting the maze all over again, but with having a map. I, you know, when you first go to services, sometimes you don't even know what an advocate is. And um, that's why the point on uh, advocacy is, is, is key. Um, but I think a lot of the stuff that's in the um, Mental Health Act review and in the white paper is like kind of, kind of already out there, to be honest with you. So the stuff around least restrictive interventions and um, you know, involving people and stuff, I mean, that's already out there. And um, I'm not saying it's already out there as in discussion. I'm saying it's already out there in policy. The CQC go in and actually enforce these things already. But again, that's why I'm saying it's wider than just the Mental Health Act review, or even policy in some cases. Policy drives change, yes, it frees up resources, yes, but it's about the culture. Until we change the culture and the way clinicians are taught, um, and not necessarily doctors only, I'm talking about nurses, um, support workers, um, and you know the, 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 the whole service, if you like. Um, otherwise, we're just gonna have tokenistic exercises, for example, recovery colleges. Yeah, no, uh, thanks for that answer, Raf. Um, it's, it's difficult because we, we're trying to address very broad societal kind of reflections as well as quite nitty gritty white paper related discussions. So I, I know within the chats, there's lots of uh, uh, reflections on the use of um, ACDs, uh, those advanced kind of choice documents, uh, as well as a nominated person. Um, 
Michael, you thought this is a, certainly a sensible way of approaching it. Oh, yes. Yeah. Um, I, I think, I mean, the advanced choice documents sound a very good idea. Um, I think one thing that patients have often said um, in conversations I've been involved in is that they'd had clear ideas of the sort of care or treatment plans that they want to put in place. Um, were they in crisis or were they to be admitted to a ward? And they'd even sometimes written written them out um, or and even tried to find, you know, appropriate templates to write them on to get them noticed and actually really struggled um, to get anyone to take account of their choices prior to admission um, uh, or even when in community teams or under home-based treatment teams um, or crisis teams. So um, I think that, it's, that, that could be a really useful tool, a statutory form that people automatically look at and apply it to the management plan. And similarly, having to have a, a verified management plan um, uh, soon after admission is a great idea. And, and uh, one of the suggestions within um, the review was that um, that verified management plan could actually become a substitute for report writing for clinicians. Instead of putting your efforts into writing a legal document to convince a tribunal judge, you actually had to put together a good quality shared management plan with the patient, um, which you then put to the tribunal to say, you know, this this is this is uh, the justification for ongoing treatment at the moment, and and that sounds uh, uh, like it's going to encourage more healthy collaboration to me. Thanks, Michael. And, and Adia, I want to come to yourself around CTOs. So they're the community, community treatment orders. Um, one, of, one of the feelings, I think it's, it's from yourself, Michael, just that it feels somewhat too prescriptive. Um, there's all, already the, the individuals who are on more than two years. So what does that mean to actual caseload management and moving forward? Do you have any perspective yeah. on that, Adia? I think it's a positive thing, really. I think it's a positive thing. Um, you know, people sometimes, yes, uh, will need the CTO, but the, the, the concern is that even those who actually need the CTO are not reviewed regularly. And even the conditions as well are not reviewed regularly because, uh, you know, same condition that applies now might not, say, might not apply in the year's time. And that's the thing. And, you know, renewal should not be automatic. It should be with the, with the mindset to actually consider actually taking people off the CTO. And some individuals actually shouldn't be on the CTO, uh, but they're placed on CTOs because um, of lack of services in the community, because that support isn't there in the community. So uh, even the white paper identifies that, you know, while yes, these reforms are important, there needs to be, uh, you know, investment in resources out there to support people um, to be able to stay safe and stay well in the community. And so CTO should not be used as a way to bolster the inadequacies of, uh, you know, of, of community um, support. So I think it's high time that's the case. Yes, two years seems very prescriptive, but I think what it does in the spirit of the proposed changes, it forces people to, to think, not once, not twice, not three times, 10 times. So we think and we think that actually, that this person needs to be on a, on a CTO. Thank you, Eddie. Um, Raf, I'm going to come to you. Um, in terms of the patient and race equality framework, do you feel that this is a token exercise and how will it actually work in practice? Um, oh, to, wait, it was specifically on the culturally appropriate advocacy that we were talking about. Yeah. Um, well, it, it goes back to like what I was talking about in terms of um, resources, to be honest with you. Um, I think until we actually start to see resources put into it, um, it it's not going to happen. I know it's quite a basic thing to say, but, you know, obviously the recommendations were accepted, but now it's about actually seeing it happen. And um, it's called a paper. And at the moment, all it is is really a paper, isn't it? So we, we ought to see some real change. I know someone just put a comment in there, says we need to reduce restrictive practices, but do we not need to know how we are doing it first? Well, we know how to reduce restrictive practices. It's called uh, it's being individualized, isn't it? It's called, um, you know, person-centered care. I mean, the elimination of blanket restrictions and treating people as individuals, not turning the telly off for everyone at midnight when there's 10 minutes left of a film and then it leads to a restraint, another restrictive practice, and then seclusion, which is another restrictive practice. I mean, um, you know, we just treat people as individuals. That's how we get rid of reducing restrictive practices. So. 
Yeah, no, thanks for that. It's, clearly, it's, it's about humanity, isn't it? Uh, how we address these kind of issues. Um, uh, I'm going to move on probably in another three questions or so, and I am mindful there's so many questions, I think we'll probably have to do a part two update. Um, th there's, there's some confusion, Michael, about how we apply Mental Capacity Act and Mental Health Act when it comes to seclusion and restraint. Are we muddying the water here, or does this make it clearer? <laughs> Well, uh, yeah, it, it, it's very difficult. I mean, I touched on some of the um, the alternative approaches um, in, in my talk. And I think um, there's actually what I wanted to draw attention to really is there's a very broad pool of ideas and approaches that have been used um, internationally and trialed nationally. And, and in fact, um, there are lots of themes that go round um, and come back again. You know, even the 1959 Mental Health Act had a, a, a lot about the distinction between health and social care, um, which we're all of a sudden discovering again as though it were totally novel. And so th there's, there, is a, there is that sort of um, blurring um, when, we, when we talk about, you know, re removing one type of provision and replacing it with another. But as somebody else pointed out, most of our capacity based laws um don't uh, very effectively allow for um uh, things like seclusion that um uh, that uh, that we might want to provide for okay you might you might say that uh, dolls covers that or liberty protection safeguards will cover that um but uh, but i think it's i think it's useful to have clear well defined legislation whatever it is we eventually um go for and Mike, can I, may I just interject one point and just say, um, you know, uh, on the point of seclusion, um, the reason why seclusions happen is because there's a seclusion room. You know, where they get they tend to get used a lot. When you take seclusion out, uh, a seclusion room out of the picture, and um, start mm. to find a way how to manage. And um, I think that should probably be, it will be something that will probably be put into policy at some time, hopefully in my lifetime. Mm, no, good point. I think that's that's true. They say um, if the only tool you, you have is a hammer, then every problem's a nail. Um, you know, if the resource is there, then it will get used. And sometimes you find, uh, as as Basalia did in in Trieste, that you re you remove a facility and you actually create solutions. Thank you. I think Basaglia is quite an interesting uh, discussion, isn't it? Because I think uh, the UK came from a point of cynicism as opposed to trying to exactly learn what, what they did that was different. But certainly it's, it's a different approach. Um, and we, we can certainly talk about that in more detail at a later point. Um, just whizzing through, um, I think some of the uh, some of the feelings around um, uh, you know, when it comes to LD um, patients as well as autism, uh, is inpatient really the best place? Uh, and does what, what does that mean for Section Three? Uh, I don't know what your thoughts were, AD. Um, again, these are these are more kind of specific points about the the white paper itself. Yeah, so the white paper definitely, definitely, of course, they they suggesting. I think the Royal College also did a response to that as well, suggesting, of course, changing from LD to intellectual disability. Uh, and calling it people with autism. Mm. And the, the key thing is, a lot of people are locked up in hospital unnecessarily. And I think the reasons why this happened is to fill up the gaps in the community. I think it goes back to the same thing as well. Uh, you know, people can be supported out there. And, and I think the, the stricter rules in terms of making sure that people actually have a probable mental disorder, I think it's essential in terms of people with end disability. But I think, uh, you know, there should be a general, there should be a reduction, number one, in admission at all, because I've seen people working in an inpatient, acute inpatient ward, people with learning disability don't do too well um, in hospital. And in fact, they, they, they tend to get worse, really. And the aim is to try and get people out of hospital as, as much as possible. So I think one of the key things government, of course, need to, need to, need to understand is that apart from making these changes, we need to make sure that you know, services are well equipped, community mental health teams are well equipped and well resourced to manage things in the community. 
These common reasons why people with learning disability might get admitted to hospital, their changes in key carers, their changes in the accommodation, or their issues in terms of the support they have out there. And the easiest way is to get agitated, distressed, to get admitted or detained to hospital. Whereas if you know you have other forms of setup set up for people to be able to look after them in the community, then that will definitely reduce the number of admissions and the detention of people with learning disabilities. Mm. Thank you, Eddie. Um, uh, Raf, I, I know you've, you've sat on various uh, panels and, and groups, especially when talking about the, the white paper recommendations, ethnic minorities. I think it's it's obviously written, but all the research shows that ethnic minorities have, um, whether it's a poorer experience or a lack of understanding within the interface with mental health services. Um, how do we how do we better understand as to reasons why? Because a lot of these survey responses have been very limited or at least been predominantly from white Caucasian individuals. Yeah, well, I, I think, um, you know, I think Michael touched upon it earlier, really. So I think it's taking a more macro perspective on the issues that surround um, people from being backgrounds. And, um, you know, there are socioeconomic factors which are, are often kind of um, what well, we talk about a lot more these days, but certainly not so much when I was a service user. And um, also just, again, it goes back to like building trust for me, really. I mean, um, look at the vaccines at the moment, for example, you know, it, it, it comes back down to trust. I don't feel that it's any different for mental health either, uh, really. Um, a lot of um, my friends or people that I work with who are, are detained under the Mental Health Act or have used services before from um, being backgrounds, um, they seem to have more of a lack of trust in clinicians uh, than others. The good thing is, is that, um, I don't know if it's just my organization, but there's increasingly more uh, RCs from being backgrounds. <laughs> so uh, I think that kind of uh, fills the gap. And I don't know if we've seen an increase in that. I, don't, I haven't seen any data, um, but certainly I do. Uh, I feel that psychiatrists um, are, and junior doctors are quite a diverse makeup. And then um, that does make a big difference, believe it or not, and more of a difference than uh, you would believe. Can I just say that, just to, just to add something, thanks for that, Raf. And because I, I think, yes, you know, um, in terms of psychiatry, especially as a, you know, as a specialty, you've got a you know, diverse variety of professionals from different backgrounds. One of the key areas in terms of the, the just the point of entry before people come into hospital is one of the key areas. We were talking about the general public and other people involved in the administration of the mental health tax. So, for example, the white paper is also suggesting, you know, improving relations in terms of policing and the ambulance services, for instance. So a lot of people from being background, for example, are usually detained um, via the police. So they're brought in police vans, police vehicles and so on. And the suggestion that there needs to be better training for police, that's very important. There needs to be uh, improved provision of ambulance services as well, rather than using the police, for example. There's stock in the white paper about um, obtaining mental health transport vehicles, such that you know, if there's any response or need or requirement for people suffering mental health problems, rather than the police attending, actually uh, it would be a special mental health boss, not mental health reason about the boss, but the staff are well equipped and well-trained to be able to support people um, adequately. And I think those little things do matter uh, in itself and also changes people's experiences. If you go to someone's home, you've got six police officers breaking down the door and everything, the likelihood that that person is going to come in informally is very, very low. Um, but whereas if you go in there in a different, in a different setup, different whatever, there's a chance that person might say, yeah, I think I need to come into hospital. So those are things that need to be tackled as well, even before people come into hospital. Yeah, no. So that, that and that goes back, like it goes back to my point about this uh, trust generally, because um, once when you have that culture of trust, we're able to identify things before it gets to that point of someone getting admitted into hospital. And um, I think you know it's uh, probably a, a challenge enough for, for getting some of my mates to um, trust the clinicians. Uh, probably, uh, but it's probably easier than getting them to trust the police. Yeah, certainly planned care is always the best care, isn't it? That's that's the that's the gold standard. And looking through all the all the reflections, clearly funding is important, but um, 
there's obviously that parity issue and there's very little funding if i guess in real terms we've actually lost over the years um, yeah, the choices, the choices again is a, a big factor you know I, I go to my gp and i've got a physical health condition he says what what hospital would you want to go to you have a mental health breakdown you're in a 136 you don't know where you are yeah so i am mindful of the time guys thank you again raf Michael and and Aidy. Um, there's, there's been lots of important discussions. There's so many questions we haven't been able to answer, but please do give us some time. We'll try to get those addressed in due course. Um, so I just want to thank again, uh, and especially to the audience, thank you so much for uh, engaging and um, reflecting on your uh, clinical as well as personal experience. It's been certainly uh, been heartwarming uh, as well as educational. Um, and please do continue to support us and look after yourself, everyone. Thank you.